Hello, my name is Annie Rogers, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD experts presentation. Today's is titled ADHD Ages and Stages Part 2, Common Challenges and Practical Strategies for Teens and Young Adults with ADHD. So if you, like me, are the parent of a teen or young adult, uh, I don't need to tell you that adolescence is marked by dramatic change, uh, physical, emotional, social, all of that dramatic transition requires um, our teens to build new skills, to gain maturity and confidence and achieve greater independence. Um, of course, all of this puts a lot of stress and strain on executive functions, which as we know are already stressed and strained in teens and young adults with ADHD. So in today's webinar, which is the second of three um, ages and stages uh, series webinars, uh, certified counselor and coach Meg Leahy will be offering practical strategies um, and support for adolescents and parents of adolescents. Um, we're, we're so pleased to have Meg today leading this really important webinar. She is a nationally certified counselor and board certified coach with special certifications in life, leadership, and career coaching. Um, an educator, counselor, coach, author, and mentor for more than 20 years, Meg believes in providing the skills, understanding, and resources to really help people change their lives. Um, she's the author of two editions of the book, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorders Throughout the Lifespan, and has written numerous articles, blogs, and webinars on ADHD and mental health issues. She's also worked uh, very closely with college students and adults as a clinical associate in the Adult ADHD Treatment and Research Program which is in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania. And she's a mentor in the Macy Undergraduate Leadership Fellows Panel at Drexel University. Um, to learn more about Meg, we hope you'll visit LeahyLearning.com. That's L-E-A-H-Y-L-E-A-R-N-I-N-G. Um, and so I'm gonna ha hand over the microphone to Meg in just a moment. I have just a few little housekeeping items to take care of. Those of you who are tuned into the live webinar, please know you can download the slides by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, just look out for instructions that you will receive in an email about an hour after we wrap up the live broadcast. If you are listening instead in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search for podcast 373 to access the slides, the webinar re replay, and the certificate of attendance option. Finally, if you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. So without further ado, I am so pleased to welcome Meg Leahy. Meg, thank you so much for joining us today and leading this discussion on teens and adolescents with ADHD. Thank you. I'm really excited to be back again today and um, to get to part two of the Ages and Stages webinar. And um, also, again, really excited to have inspired the series with my AppSard webinar back in 2018. So there's just a lot that um, I have to share and a lot that I think keeps changing and we keep learning more. So I'm ready to get started and talk about teens and young adults today. Um, I'm gonna start here, which is a place that I started in my child, uh, the children's uh, webinar, which is a quote from Fitzgerald. And it says, the test of a first rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time, and yet still retain the ability to function. 
One should, for example, be able to see that things are hopeless and yet be determined to make them otherwise. And what I talk about a lot is that I feel like this quote really puts into words how I feel about working with ADHD and that the way that I help my clients in order to help them make progress and succeed, I have to get inside their heads, understand how their brains work. And that means understanding not only just the symptoms of ADHD, but how they can present and the challenges they bring. So it means putting a lot of understanding in, and then once you get to understanding some planning to get to problem solving and tweaking and constantly moving forward. And all of that is what we're gonna talk about today. So I also like to review a few basics before we get started. And these basics apply to um, people with ADHD of any age. And I think it's just good to repeat them so that everybody is clear. Um, this is a list I put together over the last 20 years. And um, I found that everyone with ADHD, no matter their age, um, and the people who support them really need to understand these things in order to make change and be successful. The first is simply understanding the lifetime, what across the lifespan or, or across the lifetime means. I found very often that we throw this phrase around as professionals um, and no one really explains it to someone with ADHD. And um, while we're talking about ADHD in young adults and teenagers today, ADHD is a lifelong condition. You don't grow out of it. It lasts a lifetime and the symptoms and challenges evolve and change with time, which we're gonna see in my presentation today, especially. Um, and that leads me to my next point that ADHD is chronic, which is also sometimes confusing to individuals with ADHD and the people who support them. It means not necessarily that it's constant. Chronic means that it never permanently goes away. It can be better at times, it can be worse at times, and it will need ongoing treatment. And that treatment might be different over time and it might last longer, be shorter. There might be times without treatment, but you're gonna have to, because it is chronic, you're gonna have to keep an eye on it and continue to tweak the way that you treat it. Um, most people are used to going to the doctor for a cold or a broken bone. You would get a treatment and it's resolved in a few days or a few weeks and you don't think about it again. So if you're in that mindset of understanding that that's how medical treatment works, ADHD can be a little confusing um, in how, it's, how you need to treat it. And I think that it's really important to make sure that people understand this because otherwise they'll get frustrated and then they'll avoid actually getting the treatment that they need. Um, the last one, I think, nope, third one, is what ADHD looks like in action. As I mentioned earlier, each person with ADHD has something unique going on inside and outside of their brains. Um, symptom lists are great, they're neat, they're clean on paper, but in real life, symptoms emerge in many ways and at many different times. So don't get locked into what ADHD should look like. That's how many uh, clients that I've had with inattentive symptoms, especially girls and women, get misdiagnosed or don't get diagnosed at all early in life. And also a lot of times what we're going to talk about a little bit today is that in the teen years, I have a lot of uh, parents and clients who say to me, but they can focus on something that they enjoy. And that's really hyper-focus. It doesn't mean it's not the argument that they don't have ADHD. So that can be confusing for people. Um, the next question that I like to talk about is, does this mean a lifetime of support? And like I said before, yes, it does. It doesn't have to be continuous. Um, it doesn't have to be with just one person, but the best way to ensure holistic treatment is to start to assemble a team from the minute that you find out that you have a diagnosis. So if it's lower school, middle school, high school, college, young adulthood, you wanna get the psychiatrist, psychologist, therapist, tutors, coaches, the school personnel, any of those people that can be helpful together and communicating with each other because this will not only save time and energy, it will help complete a, a whole picture of your child and the situation that's going on. And that way, you know more about your child, the team members know more about your child because 
children will come into my office, especially young adults in the teen years, and share things that they might not be comfortable saying at home or to a teacher. And then sometimes they'll be exhibiting behaviors in school or on the sports fields or somewhere else that we won't be seeing. So to be able to have that full team to give you a 360 degree view of what it's looking like is gonna help you find the best results. And lastly, the one last thing before we move on, uh, one size does not fit all. And what I mean by that is that in my first session with every client, I always say that if it isn't working for either one of us, I'll help you find someone else to work with. And I think it's really important that children and teens and young adults with ADHD and the people who love them know that they deserve to ask for what they need. This might mean that they have to see a number of different people until they get the right fit, and that's okay. It might mean that you have to interview a number of professionals or even start and discontinue different treatments. And it does take a lot of effort. It takes a lot of patience. And it might be the third or fourth person that you get to that will help change your life. So it's better to spend time searching for the right fit than wasting time doing something that you know isn't helping, especially with teens and young adults, because you don't want to burn them out. They're already frustrated with being a teenager and the things that they're going through. And so you wanna be able to get them to a place where they feel good about themselves and they are making progress. Because if they're stuck in a place that they're not making progress, sometimes that only exacerbates the ADHD symptoms. Okay, so those are just a few basics that I wanted to share that apply to all stages of the ADHD lifespan. Now that we've clarified what the lifespan is, and we're going to move into supporting teens. Sorry, I'm a little bit all over here with my slides. Supporting teens and young adults with ADHD. And today I broke it into three parts, like I did last time, just to keep everybody, make it easier, follow the same um, routine. So symptoms and their challenges, strategies and treatments. So I've got about 35 minutes left, so we might um, move quickly through some of this. And again, as I always say, feel free to reach out if you have any questions or need clarification on anything that I speak about today. Okay, so many of you are familiar with the symptoms of ADHD in children. And this is the symptom list. You may have seen it on the Attitude website. You may be living it personally, and um, you feel like maybe you've gotten things under control, and things are going well, and you have your team in place, and homework is getting handed in, and then dun -dun -dun, all of a sudden, you have a teenager. And I like to call the teenage years the perfect storm because especially for ADHD families, because you have teens who have changing hormones, you have a higher level of academics, which is really gonna um, require a higher level of executive functioning. And you have this need for independence, this push pull with parents, um, which could increase their impulsivity in a time when they're facing things that are developmental milestones, like learning to drive, um, beginning relationships with romantic relationships, experimenting with drugs and alcohol, and um, developing friend groups. So it can be a very bumpy ride during the, the teen years. It's We talked about a roller coaster in the, the childhood, and this is more little bumpier. It's one of those old fashioned wooden roller coasters where you get jolted around a lot. Um, so I think if we um, take a look at how things change, that is a good place for us to start and help you understand what is going on. So these are what the symptoms in teens and young adults tend to look like, which are similar to the childhood symptoms, but a little bit different and a little bit more dangerous because you don't have the complete control that you did over 
um, a child that you drove to school and a child that you knew was in one classroom all day. So distractibility and lack of focus across the board, disorganization and forgetfulness, again, pretty common across the board, self-focused behavior. So that is um, one that is often confusing for parents because they're not sure if it's a teenage behavior or an ADHD behavior. Hyperactivity and fidgeting, heightened emotionality and rejection sensitive dysphoria, which is something um, that there could be a whole other webinar on, and I'm sure there will be if there isn't already on the Attitude website. Um, impulsivity and poor decision-making. So there's a difference between being impulsive and wanting to constantly go to the bathroom in grade school or need to answer immediately or playing too rough, you know, at recess to being a teenager now and making decisions about staying out too late or getting in the car and paying attention when you're driving and hanging out and establishing the right romantic and friend relationships and groups. And the last one here is poor concentration and trouble finishing tasks. And this is inside the classroom, at home, socially, we're gonna see this across the board for teenagers. Um, and the way that it really has an impact at a time when they have no control over the changes that they're feeling in their bodies. They don't feel like they have any control over their life because they're gaining this new independence, but they're not totally ready for it. And I'm not sure this is always a big uh, reveal to a lot of my clients is that they, um, say that there, there's some math involved and it, it varies, but that the um, chronicle age of an individual with ADHD, their um, mature, maturity age is usually two thirds of that age. So if you have an, a 21 year old, I'm really bad at math, but you know where I'm going with this. So basically you're functioning at the maturity level of someone who is three or four years younger than their chronological age. And that's important to keep in mind when you're frustrated and don't understand why they can't comprehend what's going on or the seriousness of the issues that they are experiencing. So as I said, high school, middle school and high school, turns into the perfect storm. Um, and that is not so much a lack of willpower, which many um, parents will start to maybe think or believe. I sometimes get the call that their children are lazy. And my 25 going on 25 years of experience, I have only ever encountered two lazy students, I'm gonna say. Um, most people are just stuck and they're stuck because either the chemical makeup of their brain has been thrown off or they're not sure how to proceed or in they're in a place that they are not able to succeed. So with a plan and some implementations, it's possible to move forward. And I just like to remind all parents of that. Now, the thing that's the most important during this time is something that you hear a lot of talk about as well, which is the role of executive function. These functions start to develop but are not completely developed during the teen and young adult years. So the role of the executive functions being able to stop an action when sit situations suddenly change. So we used to call that with children transitions. You know, if you had a, a student who couldn't move to the classroom before he finished his work or didn't have a chance to write his homework down because he was too stressed about moving to the next classroom, that's response inhibition, like inability to stop and pivot and go on. Working memory is something that you may have started to see, but now as the um, work, 
the social and the sports schedules all become more complicated, um, working memory is going to be a struggle that is going to cause a lot of um, challenges, along with emotional control. We talked about emotional dysregulation before and understanding the social contract. And um, that's another piece that falls under executive function. Flexibility, the ability to, like we talked about with response inhibition, be able to be able to change and tweak and go along and not have things have to be completed. Many of the young adults and college students I work with, they'll pick one task and they can't begin another task until that one is absolutely complete. So many people believe that ADHD is someone doing lots of things at one time, but it can also be the inverse, which is someone only being able to do one task until they can begin another task. And that's um, what we're talking about there. So flexibility is an important executive function that's required. Sustained attention, again, we've been talking about that. It gets harder now. Um, there are more things to be distracting. There's social, romantic, um, the freedom of being a teenager, of going places and doing things without their parents and you know, spending a lot of time with their peer group. So that um, definitely needs uh, the executive function of sustained attention. Task initiation is getting started, coming home, knowing when you have to start your homework, knowing when you have to begin to get yourself together, to get to school or work on time which brings us down to planning and prioritizing and organization, having all the things you need to get there um, and time management to get there in a, a non-stressful, timely manner that um, makes a huge difference. So goal-directed persistence, this is one that doesn't um, always get a lot of coverage, but it's sticking with the task when it becomes boring or difficult. So that's an executive function that is one of the most valuable and one that we really um, try to work on with my clients, being able to, once we get through the ability to sustain attention and initiate a task and plan and prioritize and organize and schedule, how do you stick to it? Especially if it's boring or it's difficult or it's just exhausting after a whole day of being in school with ADHD. And then the last one that we're gonna talk about today is the role of metacognition. And that's the awareness of understanding your own thought process. So it's thinking about your thoughts, like what did you think you were gonna do once you started this task? And what did you think when you decided to abandon it? And those sorts of prompting questions will help um, teens and young adults get back on track to where they need to be. So why is the role of executive function so important for teens and young adults? You're probably wondering. Well, all those things that I just went through, if we look here, the challenge, the, the challenges, the real life challenges, right? Not the, just the things on paper are the complex schedules. All of a sudden they're moving between not just classrooms, but they're moving to buildings. They're moving into dorms if they've gone to college or away to school. The transitions are bigger, you know, from home to school, to lockers, to classrooms, to buildings, to play practice, to sports practice that might not be at school to back home again or possibly a job. So all of those things are going to require that time management, tracking, planning, completing, and handing in homework for multiple subjects. This is a huge one. I have so many clients who can get up, get the first three accomplished, but the last one doesn't happen. They can track it, they can plan it, they can complete it, and somehow it doesn't get handed in. Parents get super frustrated with that one. I know you're out there thinking like, yes, I have been through this. Um, so that's something we need to develop. Um, and we want all four of those steps for all of the subjects. 
because if you can get that accomplished during the teen years, it's going to make the young adult years much smoother for not just yourself, but for the teens and young adults. They're gonna to need to start conducting and organizing research for writing papers and science labs and things like that, which is a long-term planning. They're gonna to have to meet more than just a simple deadlines. There's gonna be a myriad of deadlines that they'll need to break down because projects are bigger now. So they'll have two or three long-term projects and managing getting those done. Um, sleep hygiene is another difficulty. Um, and electronics, as we all know, has have not made that any easier for anyone. We all fall victim to it, but um, it's especially important for teens and young adults whose brains are still developing to be able to put the electronics away and get the full amount of sleep that they need. Driving has been written a lot about um, by Dr. Russell Barkley. He's done a great job with that. Um, the dangers in driving for attentional issues. I mean, driving itself is dangerous, but when you add in attentional issues, it becomes even more um, worrisome for parents and stressful for the drivers. So having a plan for that. Um, substance use and abuse, procrastination, um, and not possibly not feeling successful or not feeling good about themselves. There's there's a place to hide in substance use and that can le lead to abuse. Um, so that's important to keep an eye on. And sex, a lot of teens and young adults will be having their first romantic, intimate relationships and how they handle those and are, whether they are impulsive in decision-making or able to um, reflect and be thoughtful can make a difference in their future. Um, relationships and families. So in order to manage those challenges, there's four things that are important. And as you can see from what we've talked about, self-advocacy, advocacy, finding balance, physical and mental health, and thoughtful decision-making are all important. Because in middle school and high school, students really want to be independent, right? They're so chomping at the bit to be independent that that desire develops faster than their executive function skills, which we just reviewed. And I think that you can all understand what that looks like. And then on top of that, you add the ADHD symptoms and you see that independent organizational skills and symptoms become more important because of these complex schedules that we talked about, the using lockers, the changing classrooms. So as we move on through these things, being able to advocate for themselves and to speak up about what they need and effectively communicate with their teachers about the accommodations they might need or with their clinicians, their psychologists, their psychiatrists, their therapists about what treatment is working and what treatment isn't working and the challenges that they're experiencing at home, at school and socially and with their family, talking about them with their mental and emotional health issues. Being able to use their words is what I say with my clients is just so important because unless you know truly what's going on. Parents are very anxious and they can sometimes jump to conclusions about what might be going on if there's no communication. So self-advocacy, communication go hand in hand and is one of the best ways to manage the um, challenges of the teen and young adult years. Um, let's move on to finding balance. Finding balance is important because you can get really caught up in what it is that you're not doing or that they're the teen or the young adult are not doing. So you can spend a lot of time um, 
focusing just on schoolwork and that can become demoralizing. You can focus a lot of time just on making sure that there's a job or there, that your, your child goes to after work or after school um, because you want them to have a job, which is also a great um, strategy for ADHD because I feel like that develops self-confidence. But focus on just academics or work or social obligations or family is hard for many young adults. And what a lot of them will do is that they would prefer to avoid or procrastinate and hang out with their friends either in person or online rather than study or go to bed and get the rest that they need that we were talking about. So that's um, something that the balance, if you can talk to them about when you work on scheduling, which we're going to talk about a little bit, like finding some anchors and looking at the big picture of your schedule and where you're going to work in um, all the things you want to do, school, work, social, sleep, self-care, family, things like that. Okay, physical and mental health. It's time at this point for teens and young adults to start taking ownership of their own physical and mental health. Um, you want to start giving them control of their medication routine. There's a lot of research out there that 30 minutes of exercise definitely improves ADHD, clears the brain. So either participating in a sport or having an exercise routine or a group that they work out with is definitely going to make a difference. And it's something that will make them feel good about themselves and that they should own. And it's especially important that this carry over from high school to either work or college, wherever your young adult goes next. It requires self-discipline. They're not going to make it every day or every day that they planned. So talking with them about it's okay to miss a day or two, as long as they get back at it is the most um, important takeaway there. And also talking about nutrition and eating healthy meals and snacks and helping them understand that yes, when you eat a lot of carbs and processed foods and things would die, you're probably not gonna feel as well as you would if you had a protein and some vegetables and like helping them talk through what that difference is gonna mean for them so that it becomes something that they're invested in. And then the last one here is thoughtful decision-making. Um, as they are growing and want to develop independence, it's gonna have to take, it's a fine line. You wanna model behaviors, you want to explain the big picture so they can fill things in. You wanna step back, you wanna reach out. It's a it's very conflicted time for parents. Um, so helping them, talking to them, listening to them as they try and make thoughtful decisions about if they're going to go to college, which college they might attend, if they're gonna begin a career and what to pursue and how to engage in relationships, both personal, professional, romantic, and really helping them understand, like as a parent, it's important that you understand that they haven't been through this. So they have no idea of what all of that looks like. So it's your job as a parent or a supporter or a counselor to help them understand what that that topography topography is like out there for them um, and able to answer the questions and to be able to listen and show them how to listen and consider and make a plan and take steps and make meaningful choices. Okay, so now we've talked about all the challenges and we are gonna move into strategies which I always say that um, it's important to have a number of strategies that you can use in many ways and um, you can tweak these and I'm going to give you a lot of things and you can put them in your own toolbox and if you ever have questions like I said feel free to reach out so let's get started because I know we are getting short on time 
The first strategy for school is to create a system for, electron for managing electronics. Technology, like we talked about, is a hot button issue in most households. I haven't had a client yet where technology was not an issue. Um, growing brains that we talked about, we need those executive functions to develop so teens are not getting enough sleep and they need to get the sleep to develop their brains and those executive functions. So if they're using an electronic device late into the night, they're not accomplishing any of that. They're moving in the opposite directions. So phones, tablets, computers are all unhealthy before bed. We all know by now that the blue light that they emit uh, interferes with sleep. Having them in the bedroom also makes it difficult for parents to get involved and separate them from the technology. So I have a number of suggestions. I'd like to work out an arrangement that works for everyone in the family. Um, <clears throat> I've suggested a basket somewhere, either at the bottom of the stairs, in the kitchen, where the devices can be placed before bedtime, or you could have a, a charging station somewhere where all devices have to be plugged in. And the sooner you put these systems into place, the easier it is to make sure that everybody gets the sleep that they need. So um, that I think is a game changer. There are also glasses, the blue light glasses are out there now, and I would suggest purchasing those for students who are working on homework late and might not um, have a lot of time to wind down between electronic use and bedtime. Next, we're going to talk about managing grades. And this, I feel like over the years has become a hot button issue for me. Um, and it might show my age. So the online grade book, I know you all see it. Everybody has it. They have different names out there. But the teachers are supposed to post the grades on there. So the assignments are on there, the grades are in there, you might get a final grade, you might not get a final grade, they might be filled in, they might not be filled in. Um, whether it's PowerSchool or Canvas, these systems can create conflict in families. Um, and I've had parents who are on them during the day and then their unsuspecting teen walks in the door and there's immediate conflict over what grade, what didn't get handed in or what did get handed in or what wasn't posted. And, it just becomes very stressful. And it also takes away ownership from the teens so that they aren't really sure what their grades are and they're not actively keeping track of them. So what I like to do is have a time where parents and teens set up a specific time to check their report card together, right? To review grades, to talk about ex expectations, listen to explanations, and then communicate with teachers as necessary. Really what I worry about with the online um, grade system is that it deprives children of the opportunity to negotiate and practice their executive function skills. They should understand that it's their responsibility to follow up with teachers and to own the process of presenting and explaining their grades to coaches, tutors, and parents. So doing that gives them ownership, they know where they stand, it helps their self-confidence, they know what to do next. So we have, to, because that is no longer available, like we used to have, our teachers had a grade book, we had to ask the teacher what was in it, we kept a list of what was in it, we knew what our grades were. Because that doesn't exist, um, we have to create a system and sort of work around it. And that system that I have been using with clients is called the Grade Tracker. And this is not a perfect example here, the graphic, but it is available for download on my website, free download to anybody who needs it. Um, and the grade tracker just basically, um, you look here, it's, it's very simple. It's basically like how you used to keep a homework book, right? So you can, um, you have the class name, you list the classes, the teacher's name, so we know who the teacher is. The grades that they get back every week are put in here and you can talk about it. Um, their current grade that they have, the goal grade, that's the grade that they wanna end. And this can either be quarter, semester, full year, they wanna end with, so their goal is constantly on there. And then any tests, papers, projects, and other things that are coming up this week. 
with due dates. So they can fill this out at night. And then what I like to do is on the other side of it, we establish goals and we use the goal tracker, which I print out on the other side. Um, and on the goal tracker, it helps, you know, the students practice their own organization and develop again, these executive function skills. So they can create the list of what they need to do. And they might not write it down in the order that they've decided to do it. So they write the things down that need to be done. Then they can decide what order they wanna do it in. I often will have them first estimate how long they think the task will take. So sometimes they say, oh, that only take me 15 minutes. And 45 minutes later, they're still working on it. So we wanna help them be able to manage their time and escape from the time blindness, which is often spoken about in ADHD. So estimate a time, set a timer, they can set it on their phone, let them own it, actual time when they're done, record it, talk about the differences. After they um, list the estimated time, I often will have them order the tasks. We talk about how are you deciding? Do you wanna get the easiest things out of the way first? Do you wanna get the thing that's gonna take the longest amount of time out of the way first? Hardest thing? And just talk about what that process is. And then the following night or two nights later, as you're doing these sheets, you can talk about which process works best for your child. So, the next strategy for school is use and try a variety of tools, right? So what you want to do is make sure that they have access to everything they need before they sit down to work. Because Many students today believe like, oh, it's all online, the grade book's online, my textbook's online, the assignment's online, I don't need anything else. But for ADHD, the way to deal with short-term memory issues is to manipulate the information in a number of different ways. And that includes printing things out, writing things down, making flashcards in my Part one webinar, I talk about yellow flashcards with black ink, having a timer to time things, um, using a legal pad, using a recorder, all sorts of things that you want to try. You don't have to require that the student uses it if it's not working. But if it is working, you want it to be available to them so that they can continue to use it. I myself in graduate school <laughs> had a pack of yellow index cards for my statistics class and that's what got me through. So I can tell you that it definitely does work. Next, procrastination versus avoidance. These are two very different things. Sometimes procrastination is just procrastination, just putting things off because, well, there's soccer game to watch or there's a new Ted Lasso or they miss three episodes of Ted Lasso and they want to watch that and they're putting it ahead of their homework, but they're going to get to their homework or they're going to get to the chores or they're going to get to the thing that they promised they would do with their friends. Then there's avoidance. Avoidance is when you're finding things to procrastinate about because you do not want to do the tasks at hand. And so as a parent, a counselor, a coach, a teacher, it's important to ask the question, are you procrastinating or are you avoiding? Because helping them develop that ability to reflect the metacognitions, you know, look at, examine their metacognitions about whether it's procrastination or whether it's avoidance will help them be able to develop the awareness that they need to figure out what it is that they need to do next, if that makes sense. The next thing that I like to suggest is to find a defined space for work. Yes, I can, can't see any of you, but I can hear you all saying, but they wanna do their homework in their bed. <laughs> and while that may or may not work, I'm going to suggest that students learn to put themselves in a place that's quiet and a place where they can create starting the process with that list that breaks down the tasks ahead. So those strategies 
will lessen procrastination and help students make quicker progress on the tasks at hand. So if they want to sit with you or they want to sit at their desk and make that list and they feel like they can go and do some of the tasks in their bed, choose your battles wisely. It's not a battle worth fighting if the work is getting done. If the work isn't getting done, that's when it's time for an important conversation. Okay, and the last one is to explain the concept of pills and skills, which we also talked about last time. Um, many of the younger clients that I have don't realize that medication doesn't necessarily make them focus just on academics. Like you don't take the pill and sit down and like all of a sudden you can do all of your homework straight through. Um, it might help them focus on whatever is in front of them. So if that's a video game or Ted Lasso or anything else that they're interested in, that's what they're gonna remain focused on. So explaining the way medication can help them um, practice and improve their skills, but knowing that it doesn't work in isolation and that they have to have these strategies um, in order to create the success that they're looking for. Okay, I know that we're running out of time, so I'm gonna move along quickly. I wanted to talk a little bit about college. College might not necessarily be the correct answer for all children, especially with what it costs right now. If you're a young adult who's thinking about college, you wanna find the college that is best for you. Um, you wanna talk about a gap year. You wanna talk about maybe getting a job before college because you wanna give yourself the time to understand who you are, how your brain works, and not be overwhelmed once you get to college and then not feel like, like you were prepared and not ready for things. So my big piece of advice here as someone who's won Best of Philly for college advising is to say, have a real open conversation about college be okay with not immediately going to college and look at all the options, talk to people who know what options look like, how to make a plan for time either after high school or during a gap year. So we're gonna quickly move through the college strategies and we're gonna start with consider a gap year. And everybody says, oh, a gap year. It's a huge thing that happens um, in Europe, it's uh, much more accepted there. Um, and here, I feel that uh, teens with ADHD especially would definitely benefit from a thoughtful and well-structured gap year. It would allow them to build skills. Um, and I get a lot of coach. I got a lot of coaching calls the first semester of freshman year from college students who are struggling because the scaffolding of high school fell away and suddenly they found themselves managing not only their academics, but their social life, their laundry, and putting it all together for the first time can be overwhelming if they're not prepared. So I wouldn't just suggest that they take an open year off. I would have a plan. They can apply to college junior or senior year if that's what they wanna do. Start looking junior year, applying senior year is what I mean there. Um, and then once they're accepted, they can defer a year if they like, and they can participate in career-focused internship, travel, volunteer work. There are a lot of programs out there that allow students to earn college credits during the gap year or semester. So that structured year can really help um, encourage success freshman year of college by building a student's confidence and skills. Okay, next we are going to look at finding the best fit for a student who wants to go to college. Um, choosing the right university, not necessarily the best university, because a lot of times people like to judge on name and reputation of schools. Um, but really what you need is a school that's gonna help your student with ADHD succeed. You wanna find the best fit for each student. It doesn't mean pursuing the highest ranked or most prestigious colleges. It means researching what courses are offered, which courses are required, whether language waivers are available. And if your student has struggled with language, ask if sign language, for example, is a su suitable um, substitute. You want to research the disabilities office, find out what accommodations 
are offered, encourage students to talk to and call a counselor. Um, some schools offer distraction-free rooms for taking tests, while others offer extended time. I have here a list of valuable accommodations, distraction-free testing, extended time, a note taker or a copy of professor's notes, help choosing classes, priority registration, breaking testing into sections, recording lectures, and access to audiobooks and other technology. There is no um, standardization across college campuses on the, of what accommodations are available. The uh, quality of accommodations can change depending on who is in charge of the accommodations and disability department. So I highly suggest making phone calls, doing your own research, and really finding out what the program looks like. Um, the next strategy for college is organizing the semester. It's very much like taking that um, goal and grade tracker sheet to the next level. You want to um, lay out the semester, gather all the syllabi, lay out the assignments on a master calendar, talk about the calendar, when are the tests, when is the midterm, when are the papers due, how can you best fit in a social life and physical exercise and going food shopping and doing your laundry. So it's all about that simple advice of making a plan, using the planner and finding things to, to fit that are anchors are, and then filling your time in around those anchors. So you use the class schedule as the anchor and then you allow the student and work with the student to fill in their other activities. And they're gonna have to tweak that schedule and discuss that schedule and eventually they'll get to a place where they feel very comfortable with it on their own. Don't be afraid to drop a course either, I always say. Um, encourage students to visit their professors. Professors are regular people. They put on their pants just like everyone else in the morning is what I tell them. So an important piece of college is overcoming the fear of talking with teachers about things that are painful or embarrassing. Meeting with professors allows students to hear new and nuanced descriptions of course material that they might not learn um, without office hours. So getting to know and developing a personal relationship with your professors. Med management is important in college. Setting up a system before your college students leave, um, knowing where it will be stored, knowing when they're going to take it, and um, having reminders set up for taking it, reminders for refill, and if for some reason there is um, shame or embarrassment about taking the medication, talk with them about the importance of medication as a tool um, to help them succeed. The last one here is building structure for everyday tasks, which I just talked about a little bit. You want them to try and aim for balanced meals, have a bedtime, a wake up time, get enough exercise at 30 minutes or more. Um, notice what makes you feel good, right? Add it to your day. Uh, looking at different apps and reminders to build new habits to help them succeed. Going to quickly talk about career path. And that is actually what I just want to mention here is that whether you attend college or not, um, career exploration is important for individuals with ADHD, young adults and adults. And I'm going to address that in part three of our webinar series. So make sure to tune in. And for treatment, we're going to talk about the importance of medication. Um, it can get crazy, the medication, if you don't have the plan like we just talked about. Make sure that teens are okay with taking their pills and that you have the right formulation, that you keep an eye on the medica medication type and dosage. It's going to change throughout puberty. It's going to change as their body changes and their metabolism changes. So make sure that you work closely with your um, medical clinician or psychiatrist with those changes. Transitions to middle and high school stress executive functions. So accommodations should be reviewed. 
looks like we have a little more time. Um, accommodations should be reviewed uh, in time for standardized testing, and then they should be reviewed again um, in time for college so that they go to college with the proper testing and paperwork that they're going to need to get the accommodations that they're going to need there. And I think that that is it for today. And I'm going to stop and take questions. I may have missed a few things with treatment, but I'm happy to answer questions now or later via email or text. Meg, thank you so much for, for that. You covered a lot of territory. And um, given our time constraints, I will launch right into the number one question that we received, and that is about um, the refusal to accept help. So one parent said, how do we help teens with executive functions when they push back or don't think they have a problem with things like task initiation, time management, et cetera? This was repeated many, many times. That is a great question. Um, it's a question that is what usually leads parents and their teens to find me. And what I try to explain is that you need to find someone else to get involved because at some point in middle school during puberty, your the parent's voice turns into the voice of the teacher from Charlie Brown, uh, 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 like they don't hear what you're saying. And this is a natural process because it's allowing them to differentiate from their parents, which you need them to do to move on and lead successful lives. Otherwise they will live in your basement for the rest of their lives, which no one wants. Um, so you need to find someone that you can work with that will basically most likely repeat the things that you're saying, and then they'll come home and say, well, Meg said I should do this. And it will be either very frustrating or you'll find it entertaining. But um, yes, it's important to just, you have maybe four to six years left with them in the house, try and enjoy them as parents and find someone else to take over this middle role of managing um, the academics and the other pieces. And that's a perfect segue into the number two question, which was um, your recommendations on, on finding professionals. Um, some parents specifically men mentioned therapists and others mentioned coaches. Um, so if you have any recommendations on places to go to find them and also um, questions to ask to make sure you're getting someone who really understands ADHD. That's another terrific question. So I know that there's a directory on attitude.com, which is a fantastic resource. Um, and I know that Psychology Today also has a fantastic directory. And um, I think that there is a wide variety of what's covered under the umbrella of coaching and therapy these days. So it's not so much what the title of the person is, it's what the person is going to be providing. Um, and you want to make sure that you know what, what it is that you need. If you need someone to help with homework and give you structure around homework time, um, that you're going to have to ask those questions. If you need someone helping with executive function that falls all across the board, you want to ask those questions. I am working on um, a list of questions to um, interview professionals, and that should be up on my website within the next week or so. But um, I'm also happy to help anybody if they have questions about finding the right professional. But it's basically an interview process and um, knowing what you need. Right. Okay. And we will, um, just for those of you who ask questions, we did receive well over 100 questions today, um, and we're coming up on time. So we will share your questions um, with Meg and certainly work to, to get answers and, and follow up with some resources that exist already on the site. I did just want to mention a few because we had so many questions about screen time. Um, I did just want to mention for the listeners that we have a whole section of the Attitude Mag Dot com. Um, it's under parenting and then behavior and discipline. And then we have a whole resource section on screen time. So um, please go there and know that we will follow up 
with more. Um, we are out of time. That flew by. Um, Meg, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us so many um, resources and, and things to think about. Um, and thank you to all of you for, for joining us today as well. Um, we hope that you, if you're listening, will um, take a look at our other webinars that are coming up. Um, you can find out uh, alerts on those by signing up for our free email newsletters at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. And next week, um, we are actually um, just had to reschedule our, our webinar for next week. So if you are signed up for the webinar on executive functions, um, uh, due to circumstances beyond our control, we will be rescheduling that. So um, thank you so much again, Meg, and thank you to all of our listeners. Good luck with your teens and tweens and college students out there. <laughs>